Okay, good evening everyone, and welcome back to another week in Pirkei Avos. We're going to try to fuse together the time period that we're in, which is the Sfirah Sa'imer, where we are dealing with the deaths of 24,000 students of Rabbi Akiva. And we'll see something from this week's Parsha, and we'll try to let the words of Pirkei Avos be the uniting force between everything Be'ez Hashem. Many of us are aware of the famous Gemara, that speaks about the passing of the 24,000 students of Rabbi Akiva. And it says over the following words, Rabbi Akiva, uh, this is fine. the Gemara says like this, Omru, it says, Shnei Mesar, Zugim Tamidim Hailo Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva had 12,000 pairs of students. 12,000 pairs is 24,000. Migivas are Antifras, and they extended so far, they went from the city of, 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 of Migiva, from Givas to a place called Antifras, which is a very, very far uh, land space. So there were a lot, a lot of Tamidim, a lot of students. Vikulon Mesu Beperk Echad. And they all died in one particular time period of the year, which was this time between Pesach and Shavuos, somewhere within the 33-day period. Says the Gemara, why did they die? Such a rare thing, 24,000 students of one Rebbe, of one teacher, they all pass away at one time. It must have been something unusual that brought about their death. We know that nothing happens by chance. There's no such thing as coincidence. So if you have 24,000 students of the greatest Rebbe of all time, and they all pass away during this particular period. So they must have done something wrong. Isn't that likely to say? So the Gemara answers, what's the reason, Mibne? Because, because they did not give the proper respect one to the other. And that's really all the Gemara says. Rebbe Kiva had 24,000 students. They were the shining light of the future of Klal Yisrael. They were certainly well equipped with knowledge and wisdom and understanding and insight. And they were going to become the future leaders over the Jewish people. They would be the link in the chain of the Torah that they received from Rabbi Akiva, that Rabbi Akiva received from his Rebbeim, that goes all the way back to Har Sinai. And they were standing on the threshold of their leadership. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu said, it's not going to work. You know why it's not going to work for them to be the next generation? Because they did not give each other the proper respect. And so if you would walk into the base Midrash of Rabbi Akiva, you would see the finest of sages, the greatest of tzaddikim, were pushing each other around, tripping one guy over the other and making him fall on the floor and then laughing laughing in, in, in jest as he's lying on the ground and he's recovering from his wounds? What would you see was the lack of cover, the lack of respect? They put the pie in their face on their birthday. What did they do? They made jokes about them. They said lush and horror about them. What would make sense that the, that the students of Rabbi Akiva, who were the greatest students of Torah of that generation, probably of many generations that ever existed in the history of the world, how is it possible that these students did not have the proper covet, the proper honor, one for the other? But let's just make the question a little bit stronger. In this week's Parsha, there is a mitzvah. And the mitzvah is, Ve'ahavta l'reyecha kamoicha. You have to love your fellow Jew the way that you love yourself, says the verse, Ani Hashem, because I am Hashem. I love every Jew. I love them and take care of them. So since that you have a job to emulate me, says the Torah, you have an obligation to love your fellow Jew the way that you love yourself. Says Rashi, Omar Rabbi Akiva, the great Rebbe Akiva, the teacher of all of these students, Rebbe Akiva said, Ze klal gadol batayra, this is the major principle in which all of the Torah rests upon. 
So if you'd ask Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Akiva, what's the main part of the Torah? What's Torah all about? He would say, very simple. This week's parsha, Ve'afta l'reyecha k'meicha. You have an obligation to love your fellow Jew the way that you love yourself. Which means that Rabbi Akiva not only taught this saying, he not only believed that this was the message of the Torah, Rabbi Akiva, he lived, he breathed, he imbibed this teaching, he expressed it in all of his actions, all of his ways. There probably never was a shmuz, there never was a drasha that he gave in yeshiva to his 24,000 students where he didn't somehow come back to the message of Ve'afta l'reyecha k'moicha, you have to love your fellow like yourself. They would see Rabbi Akiva walk around the base midrash. He would go and talk with other boys in the yeshiva. And they would see the honor and the respect and the love that he gave to each and every one of them. There was no greater example in the world, especially at that time, than someone that was fulfilling the mitzvah to love your fellow Jew the way you love yourself with all of his heart, with all of his insight, with all of his emotions, with all of his intellect, everything was in to fulfilling that mitzvah. Comes along the Gemara and tells us, you know why the students of Rabbi Akiva died in, during this particular time of the year? Because they did not give each other the proper cover, the proper respect to one another. Is it possible? that the students of Rabbi Akiva, the man who bespoke everywhere that he went, the after l'reyecha k'meicha, love your fellow the way you love yourself, which means you have to honor every single Jew, man, woman, child, brilliant, not brilliant, handsome, not handsome, beautiful, not beautiful, silly, funny, no sense of humor, rich, poor, impoverished, Yosam, Almana, everybody you have to love. And the way that you show that your affection and your love for another person is, obviously you have to respect them. If you don't respect another person, if you don't show them the honor that is due to every Tzelem Elohim, to every person who is created in the godly image, so then how could you profess to be a lover of that person if you continue to embarrass them and to shame them and not to acknowledge their very existence, put them down, refuse to encourage or to love them, how could you say such a thing? So it's very, very difficult to understand how Rabbi Akiva, who was the mastermind Rosh Hashiva of that generation, he, was, um, he, ama- he, he managed to accumulate for himself 24,000 students. That is by far the largest yeshiva that there was in the world. And he was giving over this message with such warmth, with such love, with such patience, demonstrating in front of his Talmidim, his students, every single day how you respect and how you love another Jew. And then you'll tell me that those Talmidim, those very students, who learned, you know, the, the, the Chazal tell us that if a person walks in to a perfume store, even if they don't buy a single bottle of perfume, when they walk out, they are going to smell like they are drenched in perfume. Chazal tell us that if you hang around the right people and you stay near them, you stay close to them, even if perhaps you will not become on their level of righteousness, you will not reach their madrigas, their level of greatness, but merely by being around them, you will be drenched in their positive traits, in the kedushin, the holiness, and the sanctity of their being. It will be become a part of who you are. So you have a Rebbe Akiva, his whole base midrash was filled with the fragrance of the after l'riecha k'moicha. His students were learning, they were drinking thirstily the waters of Torah that he had to give over to them. And certainly they understood, as our sages teach us in the Gemara, that Gadol Shimushoi, Yaisa 
Greater is the shimush, is the service of Tamide Chachamim, which means if you are taking care of Tamide Chachamim, you are driving them where they have to go, you are running to get them their shoes or their coat or their hat, you are making sure that there's food on their desk in, the, in their office for lunchtime so that they can take care of whatever they have to take care of. If they need something, you are the gopher, you will run and get it. You're, you're happy to do such a thing. And if you could have an opportunity just to be around them, greater is being around them and serving them and seeing their greatness than even learning the words of Torah directly from their mouth. Because when we learn, it goes often into here. When we are around them and we serve them and we, are, we end up being part of their lives, their teachings go right here into our hearts. And so you have every single student that is sitting in that base midrash, all of them, who are imbibing the messages and the life of Rabbi Akiva, the after l'recha kamoicha. And then they are punished, not just a slap on the hand, not just a sickness, not just a cold, not just a pandemic, but rather HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, you cannot go on as the emissaries of Rabbi Akiva, each and every one of you is going to perish during this time. 24,000 students die, a catastrophe of the likes that the Torah world never saw before. They did not give each other the proper honor that they are supposed to. How is such things can be? <laughs> the Mishnah, in Pirkei Avos says over the following, A person learns one chapter of Torah from his friend. Or one halacha, one law. I'm in the sixth chapter of Pirkei Avos, the third Mishnah over here. You learn one chapter from your friend. You learn one halacha, one law. One verse you learn from your friend. One word you learn from your friend of Torah. One letter. You learn one letter of Torah. You don't know how to read Hebrew. And comes along your friend and he shows you the letter. He shows you the letter Aleph and you learn it from him. Says the Mishnah, Tzarech Linhog by Kovit, you must give this person honor and respect. They just opened up the world of Torah to you. They just taught you something that you did not know. They just allowed you a deeper connection with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. You owe this person tremendous honor and respect. How do we know this? We find this by David HaMelech, King David. He had a Rebbe whose name was Achi Teufel. He only learned two things from Achi Teufel. And then, and, Rabbi, and David HaMelech called him, you're my Rebbe, you're my master, you're amazing. And then the, Gemara, the, the Mishnah goes on and brings psukim verses to attest to this. So the Gemara says, if that's what David HaMelech did, he was the king of Israel. He was the greatest Talmud Chachim of the generation. He was a tzaddik. And he learned only two things from somebody else who was not as great as him. And he gave him covet and honor. He called him these tremendous accolades and names. So then, all the more so, are we going to be obligated, even if we learn one thing from somebody else who brings us deeper into the world of Torah, we must be mechab and we must honor them. A person learns one thing from his friend. How much more so is a person going to be obligated to give honor to his friend? 
Do these words of Nohag covered, giving honor to one's friend, do they sound familiar? Says the Gemara, why is it that the students of Rabbi Akiva, they died during this time? They did not give each other the proper cover, the proper respect. If you're sitting in a base Hamidrash with the shining stars of Klal Yisrael, the greatest minds all coming together to learn the teachings of the Rebbe, Rebbe Akiva, to go over Shas and Paiskim and the Gemara and the Halachic authorities, to understand the details and the nuances of every single law that is there. Certainly, without fail, you learned something from many of the people that were there inside that base Midrash together with you. Your chavrusa, your study partner, certainly taught you something. When you, you and your partner got stuck on something, you walked over to the group of guys next to you, you said, excuse me, do you understand the pshat, what this Gemara is talking about? And one of them says, yes, I do. We worked on it for the last couple of days. This is the explanation. You learn something from that person. According to the Mishnah, you have an obligation to be mechabed them, to honor them, if even one letter they taught you. And if these students were on such lofty levels of scholarship and tutelage, certainly they taught you much more than one letter. The obligation of being mechabed them properly, of giving them honor and respect, is something that is an obligation upon them. And it would seem to be that the students of Rabbi Akiva failed in that respect. Now the Meforshim, the commentators over here, are bothered. What is the lack of respect that they showed to one another? Where did they not honor their fellow Jew, their fellow friend over there in the base Midrash in the right way? So the Eitz Yosef says, on our Gemara, They didn't honor each other properly. And in the, in the Midrash says over the following words, because their eyes were stingy, their eyes were narrow, one to the other. Kloimar, what does that mean that their eyes were tsar, their eyes were very restrictive to one another? They despised each other, hard words to understand over here. And they did not want to benefit, or they did, not, they did not want to enjoy or see somebody else rise in their scholarship. They did not want to hear that somebody else understood the Gemara better than them. They were working so hard to become the greatest they could be. Could be. They refuse to acknowledge and see the greatest that somebody else can be. Says the Eitz Yosef, this is the lack of coverage. You're right, they weren't walking in there, pushing each other around, making fun of one another, laughing at each other. No, not at all. If you'd walk in that base midrash, you would just see 24,000 sadiqim. You would see them talking and learning and getting into it with fighting all the battles in the base of midrash. You would see them bring each other a chair. You would see them take, make sure that somebody had what they needed. You would see all of that. You would see sensitivities. You would see Avas Yisrael. You would see that. But deep inside the hearts, you know what Hashem was able to see? That they didn't like it when somebody knew something more than they did. It bothered them when Rabbi Akiva would ask a question in a shear. And their friend would raise them, oh, I know the answer. And he would answer to Rebbe Kiv in his eminable way, would say, ah, Yankel Givaldik, what an answer. Incredible. You should be one of the leaders of Klal Yisrael. The other students that were there, in their hearts, it began to churn, it began to burn with hatred, with jealousy, with malcontent. Says the Mishnah, 
If you learn something from somebody else, even one letter is what they could teach you. All the more so they teach you a verse, all the more so a Mishnah, all the more so a halacha, a page of Gemara, two pages of Gemara, a whole tractate. They know more than you, but they teach something to you. Don't be jealous of them. Be gracious and grateful to them that they have knowledge that they can, and they're sharing it with you. And they're bringing you into the realm of Torah and of mitzvahs that you should understand more and you should know more. Don't be jealous. You should be thankful to them that they're not keeping it to themselves. They're sharing it together with you. And you have an obligation then, says the Gemara, to be machabit, to honor them with all of your heart. Because the Klaal Godol, the main principle of all the Torah is, Ve'afto l'riecha kamoicha, love your fellow Jew the way that you love yourself. And if you cannot do that, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, and your Rebbe is Rebbe Akiva. That means that you learned from the source himself of honor, of respect. You learn from the master of the after recha kamaycha. And you're sitting in his base midst. You can't give honor. You can't appreciate another person. You have tsar eye and your eye is so narrow. Your eye is so constrained. You hear somebody else get the right answer. Ooh, it bothers you so much. Says HaKadosh Baruch Hu, then you're missing the point. Now, yes, it's a harsh punishment. And for you and for I, if we feel that way about other people, and everybody feels that sar ayin for other people, somebody else has more success, somebody else has better things, somebody else is excelling and we're not excelling. And even though, yes, we try to convince them, I'm so happy for them, I'm happy for them, yes, I'm happy for them. Everybody knows deep down inside the heart there's always that little feelings of jealousy, of discontent, of not complete happiness for the other person. Don't worry, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is not going to take away 24,000 students in our generation. Because we're not holding on that level. And that's what the Mepharshim say over here, a sefer by the name of Lechem Shamayim. He says that in reality, if you're learning from your friend and you're learning together with your friend, so he shares things with you and you share things with him. So therefore, it's understandable if the honor and the respect perhaps is not on the highest level because you think to yourself, look, he gave me, but I'm giving back to him. Two study partners, remember, 12,000 pairs of Rebbe Akiva students, they're sitting and they're learning together. So I read the Gemara and I share my understanding, and I've given you insight. You read the Gemara, you share your understanding, you've given me insight. Two guys are sitting and schmoozing at night before they go to sleep, and they're speaking about profundities of the world. So I give you my insight into the way that Hashem runs the world. I've shared something with you. And then you come back and you share something with me as well. We're getting from each other, we're benefiting from one another. Am I obligated to give you so much honor and respect, says Alechem Shemaim? No. Because since that we're both getting from each other, it's understandable. If the, the cover, the, the respect that you'd have to give to a, a Rebbe, to a teacher, is not the same. Nevertheless, when it comes to the world of Hasidus, when it comes to the world of piety, which means that I go beyond the letter of the law, in that realm, I have an obligation without fail, to anyone that will teach me a single word of Torah, I must give them the proper honor and respect. Rabbi Akiva's Tamidim, they were Hasidim. They were men of great piety. They were on the loftiest of levels in Avedis Hashem. They were so high up there with Kedusha and Tahara and purity and sanctity and, and the, the freshness and the purity of their spirit. HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, I expected so much more from you. The greater the person is, the finer is going to be the judgment. As Chazal tell us that a tzaddik is judged kachut asara like the hair's breath. And therefore, on their level, 
where they were holding in the world of supposed to be giving covet honor to one another, HaKadosh Baruch said, you're missing the point. And if you can't honor, and you can't respect, and you can't love, and you can't give, and you can't encourage, and you can't support, and you can't be happy for another person who succeeded in their studies, who succeeded in their service of Hashem, then you have missed the boat in the major foundations of Yiddishkeit that Rabbi Akiva has given over to you. In his drushes, in his shiurim, in his life, in who he was as a person. And if that's the case, says HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the chain of the Masara, of the transmission of the Torah, which Rabbi Akiva is trying to give over, it's going to end right here. And so 24,000 students, 12,000 pairs who were not nagu kavod zeh they did not give each other the proper honor and respect, they all kula mesu beperek echad, they died in this time. It's just interesting. It says kula mesu beperek echad, they all died in one perek, in one, it's really one time period. But the mission that we saw also said, if, if somebody would teach you a perik echad, one chapter of Torah, you are obligated to give them the proper honor and respect. So perhaps in a derech drush, which means uh, extrapolating over here, more esoteric statement of the Mishnah, where the Gemara over here is saying, Kula mesu beperek echad, they all died because of that one chapter that they learned from their friend and they did not give nogu kavoyzelizeh, they did not give each other the proper honor and respect. And those that are the tzaddikim, medakte kachut asar, Kodesh Baruch watches so carefully. And if you can't honor and you can't respect properly, says Hashem, then how can you pass over the Torah? which is the Torah of Rabbi Akiva. How can you pass that down to the next generation? The Ramban writes on this Mishnah, Aveyafta l'reyecha kamoicha. He says, Hafloga, it's impossible to understand, he says. Ki lo yikabel leva odem shiov es chaver ka'avasa es nafshay. Nobody would be able to accept in their heart of hearts that they have to love another person the way that they love themselves. It is an impossibility. Assuming that you are someone who loves yourself, you will know that you can't love anybody more than you love yourself. That's impossible. So how could the Torah over here come along and say, you have to love your fellow Jew the way you love yourself. Is it possible? A person loves themselves, they care about themselves, they want the best for themselves, they watch after their health, after their life, everything for themselves. How could you occupy your thoughts with thinking about somebody else in such a way? Furthermore, says the Ramban, Va'oid, further, Rabbi Akiva has a, the following case. There are two men that are walking through a desert, and there is one flask of water and I'm holding on to the flask. And I feel the weight of the water and I realize the following. There's only enough water in this flask for one of us to drink it and make it through the wilderness, the desert alive. So who's gonna get this flask? If I give the flask, I'll do a chesed, the last act of my life. If I'll take the flask of water, give it to my friend, he's going to live, I'm going to die. If I split the flask into half, so he gets half the water and I get half the water, we're both going to die. And if I take the flask of water for myself and I drink it and he gets nothing, then I'll live and he's going to die. And that seems rather selfish, especially because we know the after the Recha you have to love your fellow Jew the way you love yourself. How can I just watch him die? Says Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva is the, 
is the author of the statement that we are about to say. And that is, if you find yourself in such a precarious situation, two people, one flask of water, only enough for one to make it out of the desert alive, and you are the one that is holding on to the water, says Rabbi Akiva, Chayecha koidmin l'chayecha your life comes before the life of your friend. And so you tell your friend, I'm sorry, it pains me. But what am I going to do? Chayecha koidmin, my life comes first. I can't be the judge who's more valuable and important, but I have the water I'm going to have to drink. And you're going to die. So the same Rabbi Kiva says, means love your fellow Jew exactly the way that you love yourself. Well, what would you do in that case? If I love him the way that I love myself, and I have to drink the water for myself, so I have to live, my life comes first, so then what? I'll say, well, no, really, his life comes first because I have to love him like I love myself. What are you going to do? Says the Ramban, because of that, it's impossible, it cannot be. That when it says in the, in the Torah, there's a mitzvah to love your fellow Jew the way that you love yourself, it can't mean exactly the way that you love yourself. It's an impossibility. Rather, says the Ramban, what should you do? He says, El mitzvah a Torah. The mitzvah that the Torah is speaking about here is, You should love your friend. The way that you love yourself, that you want all the good and all the benefit and all the brachas and all the blessings to come to you and your life. And the Ramban goes on further and he explains that just as you would like health and you would like sustenance and you would like parnasa and you would like shiduchim and you would like children and you would like nachas and you would like all the good things and the wonderful blessings coming min shamayim, you want that your friends should receive no less in the world of all of the good things that HaKadosh Baruch has in store for him. And if you will see that in fact he's getting loaded up with blessings min shamayim from the heavens, and you will see that he has such goodness, such wealth, prosperity, health, children, family, job, you name it, it's all working out for him. You won't feel one tinge of jealousy on the inside of you. Rather, your eyes will be wide open with joy. Because since then, you would want all of that for yourself as well, and you would be so happy if all of that would happen. You have to rejoice and be happy for your friend as well. And if you need to go out of your way to procure for this young person, or this fellow over here, or this woman over here, or this friend of yours. Ensure that they should also have the brachas, the parnasa, the shiduchim, the children, the chule, the chule, etc., etc. Then just as you would want people to do for you, so that you could have a life of bracha, you are willing to go out of your way to make sure that this person will have bracha and goodness and kindness and chesed and rachamim and all good in their lives as well. Says the Ramban, the after l'riecha doesn't mean you have to love them exactly the way that you love yourself. That's an impossibility. I cannot love anybody more than I love myself. However, what I could do is, just as I want all of these beneficial things in my life, I also want my friend to have the same things. And I won't look down in disdain if they have everything that I have and even more. I will be happy. I will encourage them. I will dance at their simcha. I remember myself when I was getting what they call in yeshiva, an altar bacha. I was getting older than a lot of the boys that were getting married, much younger than me. <clears throat> there was a few boys my age that we weren't married yet. And it was getting increasingly difficult to go to chasanas, to go to weddings. Some of the boys were three, four, five years younger than me. They were starting off. I had friends that had gotten married already previously. They were already having children. And yes, I'm a human being. And of course, inside my heart of hearts, 
It was painful to know that they were getting married and I was still single. At a certain point, I decided, after love of my fellow Jew the way that I love myself. And like the Ramban says, just like I would want all of these brachas, I would like to get married, I would like to start a family, I would like to move on with my life. So I should rejoice and I should be happy for these young men, my friends. So what that they're two, three, four years, even five years younger than me when they're getting married, I must rejoice with them. And so I took it upon myself that from now on, instead of getting jealous and feeling miserable for myself because I didn't have that same bracha, I was going to go over and above what I would ever do by a chasana. I would go to the wedding, I would dance, I would make my friend feel so good. I would pull his relatives into the circle, I would dance with his grandparents, I would dance with the siblings, I would get other people to come on in, and I would make it the greatest dancing that you could possibly do. It was not long after that I did this, and, and I could recall being at my chasanas and just being happy for my friend. It was not long after that that I received a telephone call and, and Rabbi Gadesman, my Shadcham, was reading the Shidduch to my wife. If you are the after Lerecha Kamaycha, you will love your fellow Jew the way that you love yourself, meaning the way that you want good in your life is the way that you want good in their life. So you should know that HaKadosh Baruch Hu then he will bring you the good in your life as well. He'll take good care of you. But says Rabbi Akiva, this is the main principle of all of the Torah. It's what it's all about. You must be happy for another Jew when they receive blessing. And you have to go out of your way to do what you can to make it better for them. Says the Gemara, Rabbi Akiva and his students, what were they lacking? They were lacking the cover, the honor. What was the honor that they were lacking? So the Yitz Yosef says they had tsar eye and they could not rejoice when their friend succeeded. It bothered them if they saw Rabbi Akiva walk over to their friend and put his arm around the shoulder and say, Maishele, ah, you're learning Gewaldic today. Incredible, keep up the good work. They see it inside with somebody else going farther than they were. But Rabbi Akiva taught the after the Recha Kamaycha, which means just as you would like so many blessings in your life, you would like success and all good things in your life as well. So if you see your friend, could be your best friend, could be your study partner, there were probably siblings that were in that basement, just cousins that were there together, uncles and their children and their, and their nephews that were standing there learning in the basement just together. You must rejoice for them and be happy for them. And if not, says HaKadosh Baruch Hu, then it is impossible that I should be able to bring the Masoras HaTorah, the transmission of all of the Torah down to the next generation through you because you missed fundamental aspects of what Torah is really all about. The Rabbeinu Yoyna, writes in Shari Tshuva that the reason that we have to show the proper covet, the proper honor to each other, but specifically he writes over here, the proper honor to Chachamim, to sages, is the following. And he says, Ki chachamim, When you give honor and respect and you elevate the Chachamim, the sages, Divrehem Nishmayim, their words are going to be heard. Kuloi, and all of the nation, all the Jews are going to come and gather around them. and they will be so inspired, they want to become like them and follow in their words. And Birois Bineyadames Kokvaidam. And if people will see how much you honor your fellow Torah scholars and your sages, they will be able to increase 
their own knowledge and their understanding the other people because they'll say, that's where the real covet, that's where the honor is. And therefore I'd like to have more of what those sages have. I'd like more of their wisdom, more of their Torah, more of their connection to Hashem. Says the Rebbeinu Yoyin Shai Tshuva, that when a person is mechabir chachomim, he gives honor to the wise, to the scholars properly, you make the Jewish people such a stronger nation of Torah because everybody is enamored and impressed by the sages and then they want to be more like them and they want to learn the things that they am themselves know because they understand that's how I will rise. That's how I'll be more honorable myself in this world. When the students of Rabbi Akiva could not give each other the proper honor and the proper respect, that means they were no longer creating an example of the Chachamim that the Jewish people would gather around and would want to learn from them everything they possibly could to become greater and loftier and more brilliant and more connected to Hashem. And therefore, our Kodesh Baruch has said, I'm sorry. This is not going to be the group of the base Midrash, of the Yeshiva, that's going to bring it to the next generation. There's nothing else that I can do, again, on their high, high level. There's nothing else that I could do but to remove you from this world. Now, let's not fret because Rabbi Akiva, I think as we will see next week, Rabbi Akiva picked himself up and he found new students and he began teaching all of the Torah once again and the Torah did find its way to be transmitted to the next generation. But to a, a yeshiva of elite Torah scholars who cannot honor each other, cannot show the after lerecha kamecha in the right way, <clears throat> it is not going to come through them. And therefore, as we go through this period of time, which we call Svira Sa'imir, which on one hand is a very exalted 50 days of our lives where we are preparing ourselves, elevating day after day, going higher and higher up the rungs of the spiritual ladder, of moving towards Shavuos, getting ready to accept the Torah, and we're cleansing out our impurities, becoming more holy every single day. On the other hand, it's known as the time that we mourn the loss of the students of Rabbi Akiva because they perished and they died during this particular time of the year. And therefore our tikkun, the way that we are going to correct the mistakes of Rabbi Akiva's students which brought death upon them in such a catastrophic way is that we must fix up within ourselves any sorrow's eye and any narrowness, any stinginess of the eye where we're not happy for somebody else. And we must exemplify the midah of the after l'recha kamaycha to love your fellow the way that you love yourself, which means that I am happy for everything that somebody else has even if I don't have it myself. Because I know that I would like to have it. I know I would like to be in that, in that realm. I know I would be so besimcha if I could just have that X, Y, and Z. My friend got it. Happy for him. And if I have already all of these wonderful brachas, min shemaim, and then I see my friend beginning to gain momentum in the world of heavenly blessings, I'm not jealous. I don't say, hey, wait a second, not so fast, that's my territory. I say, yes, I'm so glad you have it because I know how it feels that brach is myself. I know how good it is to have X, Y, and Z in my life. I want you to have it as well. I'll, incur I'll do whatever I can. I'll help you in that area if it's necessary. And I'll rejoice with you for everything that you have. If we can train our eyes to look like that at, a, at our fellow Jews during this time, if we can do whatever we have within our abilities and our power to make sure that our friends are also being successful, they're also prospering in the physical, in the spiritual, in the emotional, they're also getting the benefits of the heavenly brachas coming down to them, 
So then that itself is the greatest tikkun, the greatest way that we can correct the mistakes of the 24,000 students who died so tragically during this particular time of the year. And that's why we observe these certain laws of mourning. There's not much that we do, so we don't take a haircut, we don't shave, so we don't listen to music right now, we don't make chasanas, we don't make weddings. We do it all just to remind ourselves that if you cannot understand the Klau Gadol Batayr, the main principle, which is V'yafta L'riecha K'meicha, then you're missing the whole thing altogether. I want to leave you off with a story. It's a story of the way in which a person was so in check and so in tune with themselves to understand how to be able to be mechabit, to honor other people in the right way. One of the great Musa personalities of the previous generations was a great, great tzaddik by the name of Rabbi Yosef Yezel Horowitz, who was the altar of Navarduk. And the altar of Navarduk had a daughter who married a young man by the name of Avraham Yafin. And Avram Yafin was the son-in-law of the altar. The Vardik was no small thing. The altar was a giant beyond belief. So you could imagine if he chose this young man to be his son-in-law, he was a giant in his own right. After the war was over and Rav Yafin survived the war, he ended up making his way to America. And in America, he opened up a yeshiva called Beis Yosef, which was built after the name of his father-in-law, Rabbi Yosef Yosef, the altar of Navardik. When Rabbi Avram's granddaughter, his granddaughter was getting married, and Rabbi Avram already was a much older man, out of great respect that the Gedoyle Yisrael, the leaders of the generation had, they came in the droves to honor him and his family to be there at that chasana. So you can imagine Rabbi Moshe Feinstein was there, and Rav Aaron Kotler was there, Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky was there, just to name a few of the impressive personalities of the leaders of that generation that came. And of course, what was on Rav Avram's mind? If all of these great Torah personalities are going to be at the wedding, who do I give all of the kibbutim, all of the honors to? If I give to this one and not to that one, it's a lack of cover to this Rebbe. If I give to this one and not to that one, there's a lack of covenant honor to that one. And who's going to be Masada Kedushin? Who's going to run the ceremony? Who's going to read the Ksuva? Who's going to be the Adim, the witnesses? Then this Sheva Bracha, seven blessings. Who's it going to be? And so he thought long and hard how to work it out that he should give over the honors appropriately. And he was a Balmusa, which means he was very, very sensitive to do things in the right way. As the Chup is going along, and all of the Rabbanim, one after the other, are getting their kibbutim, getting their honors, whether it was to be Masada Kedushim, whether they got a blessing under the chuppah. Suddenly, whoever is making the announcements, calling up the distinguished Rabbanim, he calls up the name of somebody that nobody recognizes at all. And everybody's looking around, who? Who did they just call up? And they see a little push in a year, a simple Jew, comes schlepping up to the chuppah. They give him the cup of wine, makes the bracha, and he goes and he sits back down. And everybody's wondering, what's going on over here? You have a cast of the greatest rabbis of the generation sitting there in the audience, and you call up this very simple Jew that nobody has any idea at all who he is? So they begin asking around, who is this? What's going on? So they find out that maybe he's a rabbi somewhere from out of town, some kind of connection with Rabbi Avram Yafin. But if Rabbi Yafin does it, so they're not going to question, he has good reasons, we're sure. But nobody could understand why was he chosen over one of the other great rabbis that was there. But nobody asked a question. Nobody had the audacity to go up to Rabbi Avram Yafin after the chuppah and say, Rabbi, what's the pshat? Why did you give this person a, a bracha? If he did it, he was very well deliberate in his actions. 
He was extremely thought out, so they knew he must have a very good reason, and nobody bothered him. They left it alone. And nobody ever asked. Only after Rav Yafin passed away, did his wife, who was the, old, the daughter of the altar of Nevardik, did she reveal the secret of that kibbut of that honor that was given at that chasana? So she told over a fascinating story. And she said years earlier, there was a student of her husband, Rabbi Avram, from Europe, when they were living already in America, and he called up his Rebbe, Rabbi Avram Yafin, and he asked him, would you please come to my, ha- my daughter's chasana? I'm making a chasana, it would mean so much to me, Rebbe. You're my Rebbe from Europe, and now we're here together in America, it would mean so much to me if you would come. Now this wedding was taking place about a couple of hours away from where Yafin lived. He was already an older man. He wasn't getting along so easily. And he told this student, I'm very sorry. I just don't think I'm going to be able to make it. Please forgive me. It's, it's an arduous trip. I just can't come. And this student was calling almost every other day, please, Rebbe, you don't know what it will mean to me. Please, please, please. It will mean so much to have you there. So finally, after saying no so many times in a row, and Yafin, Yafin said to himself, I see that it means so much to my student. I will agree to go to the chasana. And the next time the student calls, he says, okay, my dear student, I am coming. You can expect to see me there. Now, when he agreed to come to the chasana, and Yafin assumed He's an old, venerable sage. This man is begging him to come to the chasana. The chasana was a good hour or two away from where he lived. He assumed that this student was going to take care of transportation, send him a car service, a taxi, something like that. And it's the day of the chasana, and he hears nothing at all from his student when the car is going to arrive. What kind of car? Is it a taxi? What is it? Three hours before the wedding, nothing. Two hours before the wedding is about to begin, Rabbi Yafin realizes that he made a mistake. And in fact, his student is not going to send him a car service or anything. And he's going to have to start traveling by himself. So he and his wife, they were not spring chickens. They go down to the subway, and from the subway they catch a bus, and from the bus they take another bus. And eventually, after two hours of hard traveling on this elderly couple, they arrive at the Chasana Hall. And they got there, Baruch Hashem, before the chuppah started. And Yafin walks in. His student says, Oh, Rebbe, thank you so much. It means so much to me that you are here. Thank you so much. How did you get here? He says, oh, whatever, we took a subway, we took one bus, we took another bus. Oh, Baruch Hashem, so happy that you're here. Not an apology. Not, oh, I'm so sorry, I should have gotten you a car service. Don't worry, I'll take care of it on the way back. Nothing. Now comes the chuppah. Rav Yafin is recognized as one of the elderly Rosh Yeshivas in America at this time. He is the, the, the Rebbe of this particular man who is marrying off his daughter who begged him to come to the wedding. Comes time for the chuppah. He's sitting there. He's assuming probably he's going to get some kind of a kibbutz, some kind of an honor by that chuppah. They call up for Masada Kedushin, not Rabbi Yafin. Yafin. They call up reading the ksuba, not Rabbi Yafin. They call up Adim, witnesses, not Rabbi Yafin. One bracha, seven blessings. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. No brachas to Rabbi Yafin. After the chuppah is over, his wife says, what's going on over here? No car service. They didn't drive us here. And they don't give you an honor. Rabbi Yafin goes to the chasen and he dances whatever kaychas he has left. He dances, he makes a lebedic, he dances with his Talmud, he dances with the chasen, he dances with the chasen's father as if nothing has happened. And he has a wonderful, wonderful evening and at the night, the end of the night, he goes over to the Talmud to say goodbye to him and he says, ah, mazel tov, he gives so many brachas 
Such a pleasure to be at your wedding. May we share in more simchas. And then he and his wife leave the wedding hall back to the bus and to another bus and to the subway, schlep up the stairs and go back to their apartment. And the Rebetzin on the ride home, she just could not believe the shame that her husband was put through on that night, that he wasn't even the acknowledgement, the lack of honor, not even getting a brach under the chuppah, traveling so far, the student not even apologizing for the way that he had to travel and sending him back in the same way. It always bothered Rabbi Yafin. He was concerned that even though that he said, it doesn't bother me, I don't care, I don't need the covet, I don't need the honor in this world, it always bothered him. Maybe there's just a tinge in my heart where I'm upset with this person. Maybe I didn't forgive him 100% for everything he put me through that night. And maybe he did upset me. Maybe he did bother me. So if Yafin said, you know how I'm going to be able to overcome if there's any ill feelings that I have left in my heart for him? When my granddaughter is getting married and I have all of the G'dayla Yisrael, all of the great rabbis came out of honor and respect for our family, for my father-in-law, the altar of Nevardik. All of them will be there. I'm going to call up this man my student, the father of that kala, of that bride, I'm going to call him up for a bracha under the chuppah. Nobody will understand why. Everybody will be in shock and surprised. But when I do that and I give covid, I give honor to him, any slight of honor that I felt that he gave to me and if I was harboring any ill feelings towards him, I'll do away, I'll get rid of all of that at my, at my granddaughter's chasana. And sure enough, he calls up his students at his own granddaughter's chasana, where there is a room filled with the greatest Torah scholars of the generation. Nobody understands what, who, why, but it was all because Rabbi Yafin wanted to make sure that he didn't harbor any resentment. He didn't have a tsar eye, in a, a painful eye, an untrusting glance against anybody. But rather you have to honor and respect everyone the way that you would honor and you'd respect yourself. May we be zeicha in Yetz Hashem that as we go through these weeks where we are on one hand with great anticipation looking forward to receiving the Torah, on the other hand we have to make ourselves a vessel that will be able to transmit the Torah to the next generation. How do we do that? If you develop, if we develop inside of ourselves, to love our fellow Jews the way that we love ourselves, to want for their success, to be happy with what they accomplish and their achievements, and to nagu kavayt to give kavayt, to give honor to one another the way that it is appropriate, the way that we should then certainly when we stand before HaKadosh Baruch Hu on Shavuos night and Hashem is ready to impart the Torah down to cloud yourself once again as He does every single year on Shavuos, then He will look into our heart of hearts and He will see that we are truly a clear vessel that loves everyone else and cares so deeply for them and honors them with the respect that is coming to them even if they're not deserving of it. And in that way, we will be zeicher, we will merit to be the conduits to receive the Torah and to be zeicher to pass it down to the next generation as well. Have a wonderful evening, everyone.